Hello there, thank you for joining us today. It's a beautiful sunny day in London. Um, I hope your Monday is going very well. It's already time for our September webinar and we'll be looking into the strategies to adopting Elixir with Mr. Ben Marks as part of our Open Airline series. So a little bit about Ben before we start. He's a software architect from Bleacher Report. He's a co-author of Adopting Elixir and a co-organizer of the Erlang Elixir Meetup in San Francisco, where he is based. In his, free, in his free time, he is also programming in Rush. So as mentioned, this webinar is part of our Open Erlang series celebrating 20 years of open source Erlang. We've been celebrating this anniversary throughout the year with webinars, meetups, parties, and loads of delicious blog content as well. We have even more planned for the autumn and the winter, so keep your eyes peeled for that. And before we get started, we'd love to hear from you as always. You can tweet us. Our Twitter handle is pretty nice and straightforward. It's at Erlang Solutions. And you can also use the hashtag Open Erlang. Lastly, we'll be doing a question and Q&A or Q&A session at the end, excuse me. Um, so you can submit a question on, on this GoTo platform. So please keep in mind that this is a live event and we may experience some technical issues, although hopefully not today. And without further ado, I'll hand you over to Ben. Okay, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, and yeah, like uh, I'm, in, I'm based in San Francisco. It's a gloomy morning in San Francisco, but I guess it should get better as the day goes on. Sorry about that. Um, so right, so this is adopting Elixir, strategies for adopting Elixir. Um, um, I'm Ben, I'm the software architect at Bleacher Report. We've been using Elixir in production for about four years now. I think October 1st would be our first commit on our first Elixir project. Um, and Elixir was one of the main reasons why I joined Bleacher Report. I was really interested in using the language and uh, Bleacher Report seemed like a compelling place to use it. And so a lot of the, the points from this, from this talk or this webinar will be uh, lessons that we've learned in production over the last few years or also just from ch chatting with other companies or other people um, how they use Elixir, what's been easy for them and what's been what's made it success successful for them. So let's get started with what we're going to talk about today. This is a sort of the, the outline of the, of the webinar today. First we're going to talk about tempering expectations, uh, starting small if you can, uh, building a team or how to convert your own your developers to Elixir developers. Uh, consistent code, and this is going to be a big part of the whole um, of the whole webinar because this is, I think this is the most important thing that that we were that we've done that has made our Elixir adoption successful. And we'll talk about monitoring. Um, this is something that we had to learn as we go as we went, uh, since we were a pretty early adopter of the language. Um, but something that's really important to have in any kind of programming language that you have in production. And then finally. We're going to talk about Elixir adoption as a non-zero game um, and sort of how my opinion on that has changed over the, over the years as we've developed the language. So starting with temper expectations, I mean, this is pretty obvious and, and this should be, this should go for anything, not just adopting the language, but when any, when you endeavor to try anything at work or when you undertake an ambitious project, um, and have an honest conversation with the stakeholders in your company. And this is sort of, what what happened uh, at Bleacher Report um, was that we knew that feature development would slow. Um, we also had some production issues that were the reason that we investigated Elixir in the first place. So we were able to have a conversation with product and other stakeholders to say like, we have this problem in production. We think this is the way it's going to we're going to solve it. Um, and that we were able to work out a sort of a covenant between the two parties to say that. You know, over this amount of time, we're gonna get, we're gonna have this time to experiment and try new things. Um, and as a result, we're gonna lose out on some feature development. Um, but for the long run, it was a, it was the right decision, and both parties worked through it well. Um, and that included regular updates. And at the time, um, the we didn't have this, the, the same communication that we have now, uh, partially because you know um, when Dave Marks, who's the senior, uh, or who's the vice president of uh, engineering, he and I came to Bleacher Report roughly around the same time, and when we came, it was a whole new group of people, so we had to establish a new relationship with with everyone. Um, and having these regular updates and showing these incremental progress uh, reports really helped uh, with adopting the language and to make make it successful. It also sort of all of these these practices that we applied to adopting Elixir in terms of having these conversations and sort of regular updates 
we've, we've been able to apply those to uh, Bleacher Report as a whole. So a lot of the strategies that we use for adopting Elixir, it turns out that those work pretty well when you're trying other new technologies as well. So that's been really, really uh, helpful for us and was one of the reasons that we were pretty successful with the language. Um, and so this idea of, of having these regular updates meant that, that we could, that even when we had setbacks, it was okay because we understood that going in that this was an unknown and unknowable project, uh, project in a lot of ways. So, you know, if you can start small, um, it's obviously important to not take on something too big um, because it's much harder to predict how that will happen. Uh, but for us, you know, we had an immediate need. Uh, our production system was not handling the increased load that we had. We were trying to do new things with the way that we served content and our old system just couldn't handle it. So it wasn't, so we didn't start with something small. We had to start with something big and it turned out to be one of the most important um, services in our new service oriented architecture. So I guess it depends on your on your use case. Like if you're if you have some if you have a problem that you need to solve and your current technology isn't doing it, then you should probably start with that. But otherwise, start with something small. And it also depends on you know do you have a monolith or are you service service oriented architecture based? Um, we were moving from a monolith to a service oriented architecture. So for us, it was it was easier to say to take out discrete functionality from from the monolith and to turn it into a service. The nice thing about refactoring or moving or porting as opposed to writing new code was that we were able to take sort of the general structure of the project and rewrite it from Ruby to Elixir. So while it might not have been idiomatic Elixir, it worked and it worked better than what we had before. So that was a real big win for us. And what what we did at the time was we used Nginx to sort of uh, to rewrite we had a bunch of rewrite rules so that if you if the the legacy client or the client in the wild hit the legacy route then we had an nginx rule, rule to reroute to the the new elixir route and you know, if you know if you used our app one of the things that make bleacher report unique is that you can at the time at least was that you can follow any number of teams or players or what or what have you so what we what we did was we divided the, each of these uh, each of these content streams, we divided them into most popular to least popular, and so we didn't just flip the switch and say everything hits the new app. At, rather, we we took the time to say let's try out with the you know the least popular sports first. Let's see how that handles. So we were able to control that over time. Um, and this app called Terraform, a, what it does is, is it essentially does that for you without all the messy engine X rewrites. Uh, it's written by Lauren Tan. And so if you are moving from some, some app to, to a new uh, Elixir app, you can use this to sit in between and you can write and rewrite routes much easier uh, using Terraform. So that's something to consider if you've not used it before or if you're, if you're looking to do this without having to do all the messy engine X rewriting. And <clears throat> as we as we scaled up and added added more of our apps to uh, change up more of our apps, app, rewrote more of our apps in Elixir, one of the things that we had the problem was was that we had lost a lot of institutional knowledge because I think Bleacher Report is about 11 years old now. And when we came in, um, there was a lot of code that hadn't been touched in a long time, and especially since it was a monolith, things just sort of all sort of sank together into one big thing. Um, so when we moved traffic, or when we moved when we moved an app to to Elixir, and we we would put it into production because you know we would test it as well as we could in staging, um, and we would put it into production, and then we would see that something was breaking. So what we did was we thought, well, you know, processes are really easy to really cheap and inexpensive to spin up. So what if we divert our traffic from production to a staging environment or some perf environment or or what have you? Um, one of the you know, one of the characteristics of our traffic is that it's highly read heavy. It's like 99% read only traffic. Um, so that made it very easy for us to say, well, we can just intercept these calls and divert them to someone else. We can figure out figure out what the bugs are before we release into production. And so, uh, if you're familiar with plug, this is a this is a part of a plug. Um, and as you can see here, basically what what it does is it we, we call it ghosting traffic. But it takes uh, 
it takes an environment variable to see if whether or not it's enabled. And if it isn't, if it isn't enabled, it just returns nil and, and returns the con. And if it is enabled and it's uh, a get method, uh, then it picks up the 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 application to divert traffic to. It cre it creates the URL, and then it does a test dot start and and sends out the request. And so the reason we use test dot start here is because it's fire and forget. It doesn't block. It just goes and whether it fails or not, the application doesn't care. It moves on. Um, and so this was really, really helpful for us. And it was just a few lines of code here. And it was we were able to, all of our sort of integration, service integration bugs sort of fell away because of this and because it's very inexpensive. And so then how do you, of course, make sure that you're actually diverting the traffic to where it should go? And that's where monitoring comes in. But this was extremely helpful for us. And it was one of the ways that we were able to move stuff so quickly. Um, and so now that, you know, we were having success with the language and and we were we were moving at a, at a good pace but now that now the the question was how do we how do we build our team you know are we going to at the time i think including me there were about three people who were really interested and excited about the language i mean as i mentioned that was one of the reasons i came to the to bleach report um and then we had a few people who were curious a few people who were ambivalent and then maybe two or three people who were just opposed to using to using a new language. So what we what we did was it's sort of a self-selecting group, right? You know, um, because I was interested and because a couple other people were interested in it, we got together and we decided to start planning out how to write new services in Elixir, learning learning more about the language, going to conferences, these kind of things. So it's pretty clear to what what happened. Um, <clears throat> and so you look at the people with the varying interests, as I mentioned before. And like as, and as I said, they can sort of be divided into these four different groups. You have excited people like like me. Um, you have curious people who who have, who are, who want to see what happens with the language, and ambivalent people who just for whatever reason aren't that interested. And then opposed people um, who just don't want to learn something new. And I mean, you should expect this kind of res resistance. You know, we're all creatures of habit. You know, I, I like my coffee the same way. I go, to, I take the same way to work every day. And so when you're asking someone to learn something new, it's quite a big challenge, even if you're excited about it. So you should expect that resistance. But for us, what we were able to do um, was because after our initial success with the language, we had a conversation, you know, how much are we going to invest in this language? Should we continue to develop in both Ruby and Elixir? Uh, and our push notification rewrite was really what convinced us to go uh, in, in on Elixir. Um, the reason was was because push notifications are a way that we drive people to our app, and you know most apps use push notifications in the same way. Um, and our push notifications took a long time before, and we we're using we had this crazy infrastructure to 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 make even that happen. And so the way we wrote push notification, it was it was a much simpler app with fewer servers. We were able to jettison the third party service. And now our push notifications are consistently faster or the fastest among all of our competitors, which is a really nice thing to see. And this was something, you know, the sure, sure, the the first couple apps that we wrote, we wrote in Elixir, yeah, they were making our system more stable and that was good. But this was something that everyone noticed from the from the programmer, like our content programmers who actually send the alerts to our users to the to management. So this was a thing that we also decided, well, now we have to to do this. So at this point we decided, well, you know, all new feature development is going to be done in Elixir and any internal type crud admin type stuff that can be done in Ruby. So that gave people uh, a real a real reason to to learn the language because now if you're saying, well, you're just going to write crud apps all the time, that's not going to be very exciting. So this was a way that we were able to um, slowly convince people over time. And we've been we've done a pretty good job because all of our developers now are now pr proficient Elixir developers. Um, so we we tried our best to set everyone up for success, um, and what that means is, you know, by providing the right materials in terms of books to learn to read and other material. But but this is where the part that I want to talk the most about comes in is consistent code. This is where this is why I think we've had the success we've had with Elixir um, because we set out to codify standards. Um, and when I say codify, I mean I don't mean like immutable 
laws or these kind of things. Rather, we want to cut off, we have a set of sort of general areas and we, we those will change over time and they've changed in the last few years that we've, that we've been developing this. But the idea is that every app should look more or less the same in terms of its structure, in terms of its layout and these kind of things. So that since we have, I think about 30, uh, 30 services now, which means you're going as a developer, you're going to move from service to service, and we, we want to lower that barrier to entry. So if all of them look the same, it's going to be a lot easier to, to do that. <clears throat> so the first thing we did was we used Credo. So Credo is a static analysis tool. What's really nice about Credo is not that it just tells you that your code is oddly formatted or that you're doing things not idiomatically correctly, but it'll also give you uh, insight into why it's making the claims that it does. And this is really helpful, um, especially for newer developers to the language who might not understand why Credo makes the suggestion it does. This means that they can go and look into the uh, the Credo warnings or uh, themselves and see the rationale behind it. This saves them the time from context switching and having to ask a more senior developer or more advanced uh, literature developer what these errors mean. Because you know, context switching is is very expensive. You know, if you're in the middle of something and someone's always interrupting you, it's hard to 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 get the flow going. And also, if you're the person doing the interruption, it, you probably feel slightly subconscious about it. So this means that if Credo can take care of a lot of the superficial stuff, when developers come to other developers and ask questions, it's usually a logic question or usually something more advanced. So Credo is really helpful in getting a baseline sort of static analysis for our apps. Um, documenting code is something that we've done a pretty good job of doing. Um, and the Elixir team has done a really good job of making this a first class citizen. Um, so here's here's a simple function. Um, attempts to fetch, extract, embed data, and format it according to the defined type. Um, as you can see, you just add doc, attribute, and then three quotation marks to start and end. Uh, with Elixir 1.7, they added more metadata to this doc attribute. So you can also say like, since when the function, well, since which version the function was available, and also who are the authors of the, of the function, which is really nice. Um, because especially if you're writing a library that other people are using, having that this function was available since version one or version what, what, what have you, uh, it makes it a lot easier and it makes it a lot easier to, as you, uh, you know, upgrade the, the library to see what those are. So documentation has been really good, has been really helpful for us. Um, and it also, it formats, if you look at, if you go to hex docs and any of those are formatted uh, with that. So you can see how nicely that format their documentation. Um, but documentation is is subjective. Um, I really am a big fan of dialyzer. Um, so dialyzer are sort of essentially type specs for for Erlang and Elixir. Um, they don't the compiler the compiler ignores them. It doesn't use them to optimize anything. Um, but what's the nice thing about about dialyzer is that it's essentially objective documentation. Um, but the thing also the thing with dialyzer that if you're going to use it if you're starting a new project. If any, you want to use Dialyzer, start from the beginning. Um, because if you wait, you know, if you're already deep into a project and you said, well, now when you use Dialyzer, it's going to take a long time to, to retroactively go back and fix all of those Dialyzer errors. Um, so that's something to be aware of. And so here's, here's, that, here's an example of using Dialyzer in the same function. Um, as you can see, you can define custom types as in, we did, we take out a map and define that as an as a embed, and then then that with the spec attribute, function name, parameter, double colon, and then the expected output. So what's nice here is that you can see that just from reading the spec that it takes a string and it returns an embed, which you can see above is just a map. Uh, you could also have made string dot. You also made the URL param its own type, and so you would have had URL and returns an embed. Which, depending on you know how uh, how detailed you want to be, may or may not be worth the, the extra type definition. Um, but what's really nice about this is that it's, as I said before, it's objective documentation. You can run it. You can uh, if everything passes, then that means that your functions take the inputs that they expect and return the outputs that you expect. And I think that's uh, there's a lot of value in that. 
Um, but like I said, just make sure if that's something that you're interested in to start from the uh, beginning. And then finally, you, or not finally, but use the formatter. Um, I think, I don't know, looks 1.6 or 1.5, I'm not sure which one, but they uh, have the mixed formatter. Um, and people have strong opinions about how code should be formatted. You know, they, I, I don't agree with all the decisions that the that the core team uh, did when when they used the, the code formatter, and probably they might not either. But the nice thing about using the formatter is just like with Credo, is everything looks the same. So you can write the code however you want, you know, whatever your personal style might be, and then when you're done with it, format it, and then that takes one argument or one series of arguments out of the equation. You don't, there's no more discussion around how this code should look or how that code should look. It's just, here's the code. Um, so again, to me, the advantage of using the formatter is that you don't have to have these discussions about style. It's just there because you're never going to, I think, at least agree to a group what the, the optimal style is. Um, and then to use the formatter, just add a dot .formatter.exs in your project root directory. And in this case, um, you can choose the inputs of, that, the, that the code formatter will, will use. Um, and if you, you, know, if you, if you want to get really specific, you can add exceptions and change things around to make it however you, follow, however you want. Uh, but this is generally what we use at Bleacher Report, and it work, it's worked out fine for us. Um, or, you know, Elm has a formatter, Rust has a formatter. So it's, I think it's a good thing because it takes this kind of discussion off the table so you can focus on more important things. And then you can also use it so that whenever you save a file, it formats it automatically so you don't have to worry about it um, or have a, like a git pre-commit hook that does it for you or checks to see if it's done. And so all of this has been leading up to this point of this of code review, right? So this is the part where uh, where you where you can teach and 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 learn the most when you're working with new Elixir developers. Uh, so the things that we've talked about in this section, like static analysis, documentation, dialyzer, and I didn't mention tests, but of course tests are an integral part of this as well. All of these things mean that by the time the code comes to the code reviewer, you can be sure that that the code looks the way that it should. That the code. Um, has is it does what it says with type specs, you know that you have documentation that says that it does that human readable documentation, and finally the code is formatted the same. So by the time it gets to the code reviewer, you can't just you know and I'm guilty of this in the past of just doing a code review of doing a code review and seeing some you know weird formatting issues and just sort of glossing over the logical bits because you're busy or whatever. Um, but it's much harder to do that when you have apps that all look the same because now by the time the code comes to the code reviewer, the only thing left to talk about are logical issues or refactoring. You know, you can focus on what actually matters. Like if this function is doing too much or this function is, you know, confusingly named or what what have you. So it's a really nice way to make code reviews more meaningful by having these, these steps in place. Um, and finally, uh, with this section, continuous integration. Um, again, like people make mistakes. Um, you miss things, you don't. You forget to run mixed formatter. You forget to run Credo or these kind of things. But having this in your uh, mixed config or, or your your continu continuous integration means that you can do this automatically. Um, and also, it's probably better to to do it as a Git uh, pre-commit hook so that you can just make sure that this is all done. So in this part, uh, we use Circle for most of our continuous integration. So coveralls uh, will run your tests and exports the um, test coverage. Um, Credo strict will run Credo and uh, make sure there are no errors. And then mixed format does what you think it would do, where it formats and checks, where it formats the code. And then finally, we use code cover to check our code coverage and, and handy. Um, and this also makes it easier for code reviewers, especially with regard to tests, because when, when they're reviewing the code they can see they, there's a graphic on the pull request itself on GitHub that shows the test coverage deltas. So it makes it a lot easier. Um, so you don't have to go in and check the, the test coverage themselves. I mean, you should certainly check the tests, but the fact that you can see very, very quickly and easily that what's covered is covered is, is pretty handy. So let's talk a little bit about monitoring. Um, this is something that when we started with, with Elixir, 
uh, it was very it wasn't difficult, but it was it was not as easy as as it was with Ruby. Uh, we've been using we used uh, New Relic for and continue to use New Relic for our Ruby apps. Um, and it's much you know if you just add the gem and you're basically done uh, with with Elixir and Erlang at the time it was much more hands on. Um, and again, this is something that we've had to learn over the over time. But one of the most in, just like with the standards, codifying these metrics and doing them ahead of time is really important. Um, and again, these things will change over time, and some metrics will be app, app specific. But if you have sort of a general rubric rubric for what you need to do, what you need to monitor, it makes it a lot easier. And also having this as sort of a, a pre-service checklist or a pre-production launch checklist, it makes it really easy to, to, to have an idea of how well your app is going to perform and when there are problems with the app, how quickly will you be able to diagnose those? Because if you have an app, you know, and, and a lot of this is that we've learned from our own experience, but if you have knowing that, that each app will have the same basic metrics um, and will be able to monitor those metrics makes, makes it very easy to debug issues in production. It also gives you much more confidence that when you do deploy this to production, um, it'll work the way that you expect it to work. So these are some of just a, a few of the metrics that we that we monitor. Um, so the response, which would be response time, response, uh, you know, request per, per minute, request per second. Uh, query time, this is for uh, Ecto. You can get Ecto metrics. Uh, memory, these are in turn, both the memory of the box itself, or, uh, but also the various Erlang memory um, metrics. Um, and then run queue, this is important to, this will help to, to see if you have bottlenecks in your application, run queue is a good place to look. Um, atoms, there's a finite number of atoms and, and on, the, on the beam. Uh, I don't think we've ever come anywhere close to, to hitting that, that limit, but it's something that you should monitor just in case, especially if you're new with the language. And then of course, latency. Uh, so these are the are, are few metrics that we use and that uh, we found that more or less cover what we need. Um, and then as you know, if, if you know that your app is going to be CPU bound or whatever, then we can focus on doing other metrics that will bring those things to light. Um, there are two, I guess there are two popular uh, reporting libraries, monitoring or metrics reporting libraries, uh, Exometer. So we started with Exometer. Um, it's an Erlang library. It's uh, it does a lot. Uh, you can you check out all of the different things that you can do uh, with with it. Um, and we felt pretty confident using that because you know it's it's been used for a long time uh, and it's written by well known Erlang Erlangers. So we've, we've had great success with that. Um, one of the things that we noticed when we started using the language was because you have to instrument everything yourself. Um, we were we were seeing the CPU use was very low and we were seeing some other things that were very that were very low that when you compare them to our previous Ruby stack, we were getting much higher results. So we thought that we were doing something wrong because you know we thought we had divided by the wrong number or our, our calculations were wrong. But it turns out that that's just one of the, uh, that those are just the way that the, the Erlang or Erlang or Elixir apps perform in production. Um, there's also a library called Elixometer, and it's a, a, a small wrapper around Exometer. Um, so one of the sort of most difficult things when we started adopting Elixir a few years ago was that was dependency resolution. Um, so you know, if you uh, Exometer has some dependencies, and then if they're slightly versioned differently than another library that uses the same dependencies, then you're going to have to do all these, um, you're gonna have to do all these override trues in your mix file to make sure that everything works. Um, but that's largely been resolved. And we stopped, we moved back, we removed Elixometer and moved back to Exometer since then. Um, so it's something, if you have trouble with dependency resolution, then Elixometer might be worth looking into. But if but if you can avoid it, just use Exometer. The other library uh, that, we, that we use uh, is called Statics. And this is written by um, one, of the court, one of the Elixir core team members, Alexi. And we've had success with that one as well. Um, the reason that we're using two is just because we, they both report, so Statics reports to StatsD and we use Datadog to collect our, our metrics from StatsD. Um, so it's, it's just sort of a personal preference and we're just evaluating them in, in tandem. 
Um, I'm not sure if we'll make a decision to go fully one way or the other, um, but I think we're just continuing to evaluate them and trying different things with them. But I think I would recommend using either of those. And here are some, some different um, metrics, reporting libraries or APMs. Uh, you know, Wombat is from Erlang Solutions. It, uh, you can get all of the all of the beams metrics from there. Um, App Signal, okay, similar. App Signal and Scout are similar to New Relic. Uh, New Relic just released a Elixir agent. Uh, haven't used it. And then Bugsnag is exceptions and other things. And that was something that we used a while ago. And uh, Datadog, um, and was something that we have used for a while and and it worked out really well for us uh, with Xometer and that's the um, one thing I want to mention before talking about testing limits is tracing um, so tracing is something that we've recently started doing uh, since we you know when you when your system is a monolith it's easy to figure out what's going on you can just you know, especially with new relic it's very easy to see what where the bottlenecks are when you have a distributed system uh, it's much more difficult. So uh, there's two sort of tracing standards. One is open tracing and the other is open census. Um, uh, Datadog supports open tracing. So we're experimenting with that one. And there's a library called Spandex, um, so you, which which allows you to send, send spans or uh, bits of traces to, to Datadog. Um, and so that's where the Spandex comes from. Span is a segment of a trace. And then EX for Elixir, well, which is kind of a clever name. Um, and then open census. Uh, is, a, is the other sort of competing standard. And there's an Erlang library written by Tristan Slatter called Open Census, which is, you know, uh, which is a good library. I mean, uh, we haven't used that one because I don't think that it supports Open Census. And so, um, but if you, if you are interested in Open Census, that would be the way to go. So uh, one of the important things that we, that we found early on was that we need to have an idea of what our ceiling is for these applications, you know, now you know now that our system is performing well, does that mean perform well at four, eight, twelve, sixteen times traffic? Um, our traffic is very spiky, so we need to be sure that these apps can handle these you know bursts of traffic. You know, it's not uncommon for our traffic to go from whatever our normal level is to five, eight, ten times that traffic, depending on the type of alert or, or the breaking news that happens. Um, and not only that, over the past four years, what eight x, ten x et cetera means has has gotten quite larger because our user base and our user engagement is much higher than it was a few years ago. So again with Elixir this is pretty easy to do, especially with with our uh, with our model in the sense that when I mean our model heavily read heavy read traffic. So if you think back to if you remember back to the beginning um, when I talked about diverting traffic using this using this plug, well you can just add this into the plug. And then you can multiply traffic. So again, this is very cheap because we're just using processes. And I mean, it doesn't make, you know, we're not going to get 50x traffic. So there's an upper bound already on the multiplier. Um, but if we step through this code, it's essentially you take, um, you, again, this multiplier, uh, the, uh, multiplier argument is an environment variable. So you can set that to whatever you want it to be. And then range just at one to whatever number of multiplier the multiplier is, and then just like before, enumerate over them. Well, not we don't enumerate over them, but like before, we task dot start, which is fire and forget, and then we can send those out with some some other metadata or and Hackney options. Um, Hackney is the HTTP library under HT Poison. Um, so again, this is a really easy way to sort of clumsily, I guess, test your multiple multiplier of traffic. Because as you can see from this, when you multiply this, you multiply it. You say so you hit the same uh, same endpoint in n number of times. So if you're caching, if you you know if you have a CDN in the front, it's going to, you, you have to add you're gonna to have to do some URL manipulation to add some parameters, do some other things to make each request unique. Um, but this has given us a pretty decent uh, way and a very inexpensive way to to, met, to see what happens to our system when we multiply the traffic. And it's worked out really well um, for us. So, and it gives us a lot of confidence. So this is something that else that we do before we roll out a new service is we do load test it and we do use this and other other tools to make sure that, this, that the system will behave as we expect it to behave. 
Um, and this is becoming more crucial as now that over the last the last year and a half or so, uh, our focus instead has, you know, we've moved everything that really, almost everything that needs to be moved to Elixir has been done. Um, so now we are back in feature development, which has been really exciting. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, but uh, our traffic patterns are changing a little bit because now if you use the app, we have these, uh, we have the beginnings of these social features. So now we have to uh, not only send the traffic or send send these streams that you follow. We also have to incorporate social data from your from your friends network or from your follower network, um, which makes it even harder to cache. So now we have to reevaluate the way that we've been doing do, been doing things. Um, but this is the way that has helped us with that so far. And so now this is the the last section of the of the talk. Um, this is a so non-zero game. Um, of course, the opposite is a zero zero sum game where one one party wins, one party loses. This is uh, the opposite of that. And so, in an ideal situation, you would have everything be Elixir. You know, it makes it easier to uh, to reason about things. You know, all your boxes are provisioned the same way. All the development is done the same. Uh, it's just it's easier. You don't have to contact context switch between languages. Um, but of course, you know that's for, for many reasons, that might not work out for you, and it hasn't worked out that way for us as well. Um, again, it depends on what your business is and what your requirements are. Maybe you can do everything in Elixir. But one of the things that we've noticed over the last years that we've been using the language is that, of course, you know, library support isn't what it is for other languages like Ruby or C or Python or C++ or Python um, or Go or even Go or, or Java to some degree. Um, and so. One of the nice things about Elixir, of course, is that it's built on top of Erlang and it has Erlang. You can use Erlang from Erlang libraries with, from Elixir. Uh, so that was one of the in the early days uh, that we started using Elixir, we were able to make this progress we we could with Erlang libraries because they've been around, felt more confident in them, um, and without without having that sort of uh, interoperability between Erlang and Elixir, I don't think that we would have been able to use Elixir at all because we just wouldn't have had the library support that we needed. So fortunately, you had that. But when we started doing these with these new feature development on these social features, we decided to go to use Kafka. Um, it made a lot of sense for us because of the distributed log, because of the guarantees that it provides, and because of the way that we wanted to use to use the uh, our new social platform. So, but with Kafka, the problem was was that the library support at the time, which I believe was pre.9 um, for Kafka on the Elixir and Erlang side, was it wasn't uh, well, it certainly wasn't equivalent to to the Go or Java libraries or the Ruby libraries. Um, so after after dot nine, Kafka made some changes to, to auto routing to topics, some other optimizations, and at the time the Erlang and Elixir libraries. Uh, Erlang is uh, broad, uh, that's by Klarna. Um, I guess it's named after uh, Max Broad. Um, and then Kafka X is the Elixir library. And, and when we were evaluating this, we had to decide to use something that didn't support the auto routing and stick with Elixir or to try something else. And you know, I was somewhat dogmatic about this. I was like, oh, we should use the Elixir library. And you know, it was a silly position to take because you, know, you should use the, right, the best tool for the job. And so since we already had experience with Ruby, we decided to use a mixture of Ruby and Elixir. So on the producer side, we use Kafka, or sorry, the Elixir Kafka client. And then on the consumer side, we use the Ruby, one of the Ruby uh, clients. And this made the most sense for us because you know we don't have any Java infrastructure, we don't have any Go infrastructure at work, but we do have Ruby knowledge and we do have Ruby infrastructure, so we can just use that. And so that's a time that sort of compromising on using Elixir versus using other language has really worked out for us. And now that We've really committed to Kafka, and it's doing it's it's working out really well for us. Now we've decided, and that the and broad especially, um, I believe it's it's ports 1.0 and above for for Kafka now. Um, we started reevaluating broad to see if that's a viable option, so that we can again sort of um, make all of our technology Elixir. But I but it's not you know adopting Elixir doesn't mean Elixir or nothing. It means that using the right tool for the job when you can. In this case, with Kafka, it was Ruby, um, and so I guess all of this sort of comes down to the fact that you know, what does it mean to adopt Elixir? And it's it's an imperfect process, um, 
in the sense that it's never really finished. You know, our architecture isn't static. Um, Elixir as a language is changing, although not so much anymore. Uh, as Jose announced at the keynote at Elixir Conf, it's, it's basically sort of settled into what the language will be. Um, but that doesn't mean that the way that releases are done or, or things will change over the, last few, over the next few years or the way that we'll understand how to use the language will not change. I mean, the way that we've the way that we write Elixir now is distinct from when we wrote it two or three years ago. And some of that is experience-based and some of that is tools-based, as I mentioned, with uh, consistent code and these kind of things. So I think it's better to think of adopting Elixir as a, as a continuum rather than simply, well, you know, we're done or every, or you know, not everything is an Elixir, so we haven't successfully adopted the language or what have you. Um, and with that, you know, one of the nice things about adopting Elixir so early on was that you know, we adopted Phoenix, uh, right, or Elixir had just reached 1.0 and Phoenix was way about a year before 1.0. Um, so we're learning a new language, learning a new framework, and the framework was changing quite quickly. Uh, Elixir was not changing as much and Ecto was still changing as well. So we got in, we, we took in these good habits of refactoring pretty quickly um, or when, when a new version comes out, we refactor that or, and we update to that, that version. Um, as I mentioned, all of our, or almost all of our apps that use Elixir and use Phoenix are up to date with the latest version of Elixir and the latest version of Phoenix. And that includes the, the earliest apps that were Phoenix 0.5 slash dev. Um, so I think that's a, you know, it's a testament to the fact that we've in, you know, really um, incorporated this notion of targeted refactoring in, into our software lifecycle but also to the Elixir and Phoenix and Ecto teams who've done a really great job of, you know, of announcing updates, of explaining how to update. Um, and also what this means is targeted refactoring is, is also being okay with things not being optimal in every situation. And I think that's perhaps, you know, one of the, what's the difference between a senior software engineer or a software engineer. And one of the, I think one of the distinction is, is having that maturity or understanding that, you know, code can continually be refactored and continually be made better, but to understand how to target and how to target and how to focus on that refactoring to make it better. And that sort of brings us to the last bit about this. Uh, this is a quote from Candide, but let us cultivate our garden. Um, and then if you haven't read Candide, it's certainly worth, worth a read. But, you know, I think that software, that adopting Elixir or adopting a technology or software in general is more like cultivating a garden rather than Rather than uh, you know engineering like civil engineering, we don't make a bridge. You know you don't make a bridge, and then halfway halfway through the bridge design, you decide that you need to change direction. Um, so so I think that this is a nice sort of way to think about software development in general. Um, is that things change, and that you you try to have these controlled environments, but they change and things grow and environment. You know you have various things uh, that affect the way that the software is developed. Um, and thinking again of this idea of imperfection or, or, or cont of software development as a continuum really helps to make the Elixir adoption process that much easier um, because you can measure things as they go along. And so, and finally, all of this, hopefully the reason that you are interested in Elixir and want to bring it to your company or for your own personal project is that, you know, have fun with this. Like, it, this has been one of the, a, a real joy over the last few years to, to work with the language and to, to see how people are using the language. Um, so yes, so hopefully that the strategies that I've gone over over the last 40-ish minutes or so will help you in terms of uh, getting buy-in from products, in terms of uh, building a team, in, in terms of codifying uh, with code, consistent code, how to monitor, and finally, um, how to understand the what it means to adopt Elixir. And then finally, if you want to learn more, um, this is a book. This is a book that I, that I wrote with uh, Jose and Bruce. And uh, so, thanks very much. That was that was brilliant, Ben. Thank you for your time today and a great webinar. Um, it was a great sort of how-to guide for adopting Elixir, and there's code reviews, monitoring, useful tools, all of that. And um, we were discussing earlier, I think that must be the most attractive looking webinar I've come across, so <laughs> kudos for that one, Ben. Um, so we've had a few questions for you, through before you head off, um, if you don't mind. The first question is, what is the biggest setback with adopting Elixir? Um, let's see. 
I don't know. The, the, the big, I think the the biggest setback or the biggest challenge was actually uh, how to properly monitor um, and how to set auto scaling rules and how to deploy. Um, and a lot and those things have you know they're now um, a lot of it was just figuring it out. But now we have there are a bunch of companies as I showed in that in that one slide that um, where you can um, report metrics to. And there's been a big push on with distillery and how to use releases and also with a, an eventual mixed release as part of Elixir itself, I guess. Uh, so a lot of those challenges have were just the fact that there wasn't a lot of knowledge or there wasn't a lot of writings about them, but that's definitely changed now. So that shouldn't be such a burden anymore. Okay, bro. Um, what is the biggest benefit from adopting Elixir? I mean, for us, it's just system stability and performance. Um, and then, you know, secondary to that is savings on on infrastructure costs and other, like I mentioned, we were able to uh, discard third party services that were quite expensive or varying levels of expense. Um, but just and also when I started, you know, we have offices in, in here in San Francisco, in New York and London. Um, and San Francisco is where most of the where, where all the developers are and some of some of the content people, but New York and LA or New York and London are where we have all the video and you know the European sports. So that meant that if you know if there was a problem at four in the morning here, which is you know probably you know 10, 11 noon in London, then that meant that you were paged and woken up. Um, and that's largely gone away. I mean of course we still have on-call incidents because you know software is imperfect. Um, but I think the number of on-call incidents has been greatly reduced. So Quality of life uh, has is definitely also one of the big wins with Elixir for us. Okay, brilliant. Uh, we had a question come through from one of our attendees as well about the Elixir libraries. Now I've had a bit of a boo and I've completely deleted the, the question. Um, I think I sent it over to you, but the Elixir libraries. So the question was about being able to share all of the Elixir libraries. Oh, sure. Um, the ones I mentioned. Yeah, I can I can um, give give you a list afterwards, and you can add those maybe. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay, one last question. I promise I'll let you go. Um, no was everyone enthusiastic about adopting Elixir? I know you touched upon it, but um, if they weren't if they weren't enthusiastic, how did you overcome that? Um, I think there were there were only a handful. Of, well, there were like two or through people who were maybe really resistant to, to learning a new language. Um, and I think part of it was the fact that, that I mentioned when we decided that, that new uh, services would be written in Elixir or new customer services would be written in, Elix in Elixir, then that really raised the, you know, the, the reason for, the, for people to learn the language because, I mean, you know, people probably don't wanna write card apps all day. Um, and also, I think part of it was was just over time having people uh, teaching people how to use the language uh, as we codified standards that made it a lot easier. Um, and you know, when, when people were excited that these projects were successful, that was a big part of it too. You know, it's it, you want to be, most people I, I imagine want to be part of something fun and successful. Um, and Elixir provided that for us. So those are sort of the, the main things that attracted people to it. Okay, brilliant. Um, regarding Matt's question, um, you're going to, I'll send over across his details to you, Ben, to send sure. across a list of those. Um, so just as a quick reminder, that recording is going to be sent out to all of your attendees. Um, it'll be sent out this week for you to have a little revisit. Um, I know there was a lot of resources in there. Uh, but for now, it's goodbye and see you next month. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, thanks very much. Bye-bye.